In the Days of Giants, Chapter 4, The Giant Builder, read by Christopher Soulsby of Vikings Voyages and Adventures. Ages and ages ago, when the world was first made, the gods decided to build a beautiful city high above the heavens, the most glorious and wonderful city that ever was known. Asgard was to be its name, and it was to stand on Itha Plain under the shade of Yggdrasil, the great tree whose roots were underneath the earth. First of all, they built a house with a silver roof, where there were seats for all the twelve chiefs. In the midst, and high above the rest, was the wonder throne of Othan, the Allfather, whence he could see everything that happened in the sky or on the earth, or in the sea. Next, they made a fair house for Queen Frigg and her lovely daughters. Then they built a smithy with its great hammers, tongs, anvils, and bellows, where the gods could work at their favorite trade, the making of beautiful things out of gold, which they did so well that folk named that time the Golden Age. Afterwards, as they had more leisure, they built separate houses for all the Aesir, each more beautiful than the preceding, for, of course, they were continually growing more skillful. They saved Father Othan's palace until the last, for they meant this to be the largest and the most splendid of all. Gladsheim, the home of joy was the name of Othan's house, and it was built all of gold, set in the midst of a wood whereof the trees had leaves of ruddy gold, like an autumn gilded forest. For the safety of Allfather, it was surrounded by a roaring river and by a high picket fence, and there was a great courtyard within. The glory of Gladsheim was its wondrous hall, radiant with gold, the most lovely room that time has ever seen. Valhalla, the Hall of Heroes, was the name of it, and it was roofed with the mighty shields of warriors. The ceiling was made of interlaced spears, and there was a portal at the west end before which hung a great gray wolf, while over him a fierce eagle hovered. The hall was so huge that it had 540 gates, through each of which 800 men could march abreast. Indeed, there needed to be room, for this was the hall where every morning Othan received all the brave warriors who had died in battle on the earth below. And there were many heroes in those days. This was the reward which the gods gave to courage. When a hero had gloriously lost his life, the Valkyries, the nine warrior daughters of Othan, brought his body up to Valhalla on their white horses that galloped the clouds. There they lived forever after in happiness, enjoying the things that they had most loved upon earth. Every morning, they armed themselves and went out to fight with one another in the great courtyard. It was a wondrous game, wondrously played. No matter how often a hero was killed, he became alive again in time to return perfectly well to Valhalla, where he ate a delicious breakfast with the Aesir, while the beautiful Valkyries who had first brought him thither waited at table and poured the blessed mead which only the immortal taste. A happy life it was for the heroes, and a happy life for all who dwelt in Asgard, for this was before trouble had come among the gods, following the mischief of Loki. This is how the trouble began. From the beginning of time, the giants had been unfriendly to the Aesir, because the giants were older and huger and more wicked. Besides, they were jealous because the good Aesir were 
fast gaining more wisdom and power than the giants had ever known. It was the Aesir who set the fair brother and sister, sun and moon, in the sky to give light to men. And it was they also who made the jeweled stars out of sparks from the place of fire. The giants hated the Aesir and tried all in their power to injure them and the men of the earth below, whom the Aesir loved and cared for. The gods had already built a wall around Midgard, the world of men, to keep the giants out, built it of the bushy eyebrows of Ymir, the oldest and hugest of giants. Between Asgard and the giants flowed Ifing, the great river on which ice never formed, and which the gods crossed on the Rainbow Bridge. But this was not protection enough. Their beautiful new city needed a fortress. So the word went forth in Asgard. We must build us a fortress against the giants. The hugest, strongest, finest fortress that ever was built. Now, one day, soon after they had announced this decision, there came a mighty man stalking up the rainbow bridge that led to Asgard city. Who goes there? cried Heimdall the watchman, whose eyes were so keen that he could see for a hundred miles around, and whose ears were so sharp that he could hear the grass growing in the meadow and the wool on the backs of the sheep. Who goes there? No one can enter Asgard if I say no. I am a builder, said the stranger, who was a huge fellow with sleeves rolled up to show the iron muscles of his arms. I am a builder of strong towers, and I have heard that the folk of Asgard need one to help them raise a fair fortress in their city. Heimdall looked at the stranger narrowly, for there was that about him which his sharp eyes did not like. But he made no answer, only blew on his golden horn, which was so loud that it sounded through all the world. At this signal, all the Aesir came running to the Rainbow Bridge from wherever they happened to be, to find out who was coming to Asgard. For it was Heimdall's duty ever to warn them of the approach of the unknown. This fellow says he is a builder, quoth Heimdall, and he would fain build us a fortress in the city. Aye, that I would, nodded the stranger. Look at my iron arm, look at my broad back, look at my shoulders. Am I not the workman you need? Truly he is a mighty figure, vowed Othin, looking at him approvingly. How long will it take you alone to build our fortress? We can allow but one stranger at a time within our city, for safety's sake. In three half years, replied the stranger, I will undertake to build for you a castle so strong that not even the giants, should they swarm hither over Midgard, not even they could enter without your leave. Aha! cried Father Othan, well pleased at this offer. And what reward do you ask, friend, for help so timely? The stranger hummed and hawed and pulled his long beard while he thought. Then he spoke suddenly, as if the idea had just come into his mind. I will name my price, friends, he said. A small price for so great a deed? I ask you to give me Freya for my wife, and those two sparkling jewels, the sun and moon." At this demand, the gods looked grave, for Freya was their dearest treasure. She was the most beautiful maid who ever lived, the light and life of heaven, and if she should leave Asgard, joy would go with her while the sun and moon were the light and life of the Aesir's children, men who lived in the little world below. But Loki the sly whispered 
that they would be safe enough if they made another condition on their part, so hard that the builder could not fulfill it. After thinking cautiously, he spoke for them all. Mighty man, quoth he, we are willing to agree to your price upon one condition. It is too long a time that you ask. We cannot wait three half years for our castle. That is equal to three centuries when one is in a hurry. See that you finish the fort without help in one winter, one short winter, and you shall have fair Freya with the sun and moon. But if on the first day of summer, one stone is wanting to the walls, or if anyone has given you aid in the building, then your reward is lost and you shall depart without payment. So spoke Loki in the name of all the gods, but the plan was his own. At first the stranger shook his head and frowned, saying that in so short a time, no one unaided could complete the undertaking. At last, he made another offer. Let me have but my good horse to help me, and I will try, he urged. Let me bring the useful Svaldius Vadi with me to the task, and I will finish the work in one winter of short days, or lose my reward. Surely you will not deny me this little help from one four-footed friend? Then again the Aesir consulted, and the wiser of them were doubtful whether it were best to accept the stranger's offer so strangely made. But again, Loki urged them to accept. Surely there is no harm, he said. Even with his old horse to help him, he cannot build the castle in the promised time. We shall gain a fortress without trouble and with never a price to pay. Loki was so eager that, although the other Aesir did not like this crafty way of making bargains, they finally consented. Then, in the presence of the heroes, with the Valkyries and Mimir's head for witnesses, the stranger and the Aesir gave solemn promise that the bargain should be kept. On the first day of winter, the strange builder began his work, and wondrous was the way he set about it. His strength seemed as the strength of a hundred men. As for his horse, Svadilfadi, he did more work by half than even the mighty builder. In the night, he dragged the enormous rocks that were to be used in building the castle, rocks as big as mountains of the earth, while in the daytime, the stranger piled them into place with his iron arms. The Aesir watched him with amazement. Never was seen such strength in Asgard. Neither Tyr, the stout, nor Thor, the strong, could match the power of the stranger. The gods began to look at one another uneasily. Who was this mighty one who had come among them? And what if after all, he should win his reward. Freya trembled in her palace, and the sun and moon grew dim with fear. Still, the work went on, and the fort was piling higher and higher, by day and by night. There were but three days left before the end of winter, and already the building was so tall and so strong that it was safe from the attacks of any giant. The Aesir were delighted with their fine new castle, but their pride was dimmed by the fear that it must be paid for at all too costly a price. For only the gateway remained to be completed, and unless the stranger should fail to finish that in the next three days, they must give him Freya with the sun and moon. The Aesir held a meeting upon Itha Plain, a meeting full of fear and anger. At last they realized what they had done. They had made a bargain with one of the giants 
their enemies. And if he won the prize, it would mean sorrow and darkness in heaven and upon earth. How did we happen to agree to so mad a bargain? They asked one another. Who suggested the wicked plan which bids fair to cost us all that we most cherish? Then they remembered that it was Loki who had made the plan. It was he who had insisted that it be carried out, and they blamed him for all the trouble. It is your counsels, Loki, that have brought this danger upon us, quoth Father Othan, frowning. You chose the way of guile, which is not our way. It now remains for you to help us by guile, if you can. But if you cannot save for us Freya and the sun and moon, you shall die. This is my word. All the other Aesir agreed that this was just. Thor alone was away hunting evil demons at the other end of the world, so he did not know what was going on, and what dangers were threatening Asgard. Loki was much frightened at the word of Allfather. It was my fault, he cried. But how was I to know that he was a giant? He had disguised himself so that he seemed but a strong man. And as for his horse, it looks much like that of other folk. If it were not for the horse, he could not finish the work. Ha! I have a thought. The Builder shall not finish the gate. The Giant shall not receive his payment. I will cheat the fellow. Now it was the last night of winter, and there remained but a few stones to put in place at the top of the wondrous gateway. The Giant was sure of his prize, and chuckled to himself as he went out with his horse to drag the remaining stones for he did not know that the Aesir had guessed at last who he was, and that Loki was plotting to outwit him. Hardly had he gone to work when out of the wood came running a pretty little mare, who neighed to Svadilfadi, as if inviting the tired horse to leave his work and come to the green fields for a holiday. Svadilfadi, you must remember, had been working hard all winter, with never a sight of four-footed creature of his kind, and he was very lonesome and tired of dragging stones. Giving a snort of disobedience, off he ran after this new friend toward the grassy meadows. Off went the giant after him, howling with rage and running for dear life, as he saw not only his horse, but his chance of success slipping out of reach. It was a mad chase, and all Asgard thundered with the noise of galloping hoofs and the giant's mighty tread. The mare who raced ahead was Loki in disguise, and he led Svadilfadi far out of reach to a hidden meadow that he knew, so that the giant howled and panted up and down all night long without catching even a sight of his horse. Now when the morning came, the gateway was still unfinished, and night and winter had ended at the same hour. The giant's time was over, and he had forfeited his reward. The Aesir came flocking to the gateway, and how they laughed and triumphed when they found three stones wanting to complete the gate. You have failed, fellow, judged Father Othan sternly, and no price shall we pay for work that is still undone. You have failed. Leave Asgard quickly. We have seen all we want of you and of your race. Then the giant knew that he was discovered, and he was mad with rage. It was a trick, he bellowed assuming his own proper form, which was huge as a mountain and towering high beside the fortress that he had built. It was a wicked trick. You shall pay for this in one way or another. 
I cannot tear down the castle which, ungrateful ones, I have built you, stronger than the strength of any giant. But I will demolish the rest of your shining city. Indeed, he would have done so in his mighty rage. But at this moment Thor, whom Heimdall had called from the end of the earth by one blast of the golden horn, came rushing to the rescue, drawn in his chariot of goats. Thor jumped to the ground close beside the giant, and before that huge fellow knew what had happened, his head was rolling upon the ground at Father Othan's feet. For with one blow, Thor had put an end to the giant's wickedness and had saved Asgard. This is the reward you deserve, Thor cried. Not Freya, nor the sun and moon, but the death that I have in store for all the enemies of the Aesir. In this extraordinary way, the noble city of Asgard was made safe and complete by the addition of a fortress which no one, not even the giant who built it, could injure. It was so wonderstrong. But always at the top of the gate were lacking three great stones that no one was mighty enough to lift. This was a reminder to the Aesir that now they had the race of giants for their everlasting enemies. And though Loki's trick had saved them Freya, and for the world, the sun and moon. It was the beginning of trouble in Asgard, which lasted as long as Loki lived to make mischief with his guile.